Hiya. So, my name is Jazz Purewal. I am a digital entertainment lawyer, and I'm going to be talking for the next 15 minutes about everything you need to know about free-to-play games regulation. Now, I feel sorry for you, poor guys. Fairly early in the morning, you're having to deal with a lawyer, so I'll tell you a lawyer joke instead, my favorite lawyer joke. So, a man calls up a lawyer, and he says, how much will you charge for me to ask you three questions? And the lawyer says, thousand pounds. And the guy says, wow, that's a hell of a lot of money, isn't it? And the lawyer says, yes, it is. What's your third question? There you go, badumsh. So I'm going to talk with you about four things in the next few minutes. I'm going to tell you a little bit about what this free-to-play regulation is and why the, why the European Union is beginning to regulate it, what's actually been happening. I'm going to give you my 10 practical tips and then talk a little bit about the future. So uh, first of all, who am I? A few words about me. So I'm a digital entertainment and technology lawyer at, at the firm which I run, Pure Wall and Partners. Uh, I've been working in the games industry for 10 years in London and in Silicon Valley as well as in, in continental Europe. I advise game studios, uh, publishers um, and platforms on a whole bunch of legal issues. I write a blog and I'm on Twitter as well, so go check that stuff out. But enough of me. Um, the reason why free-to-play games are coming under legal scrutiny there's three things which are beginning to coalesce and have led to the regulators finally getting interested in this area. It's a combination of children beginning to use mobile games and mobile apps. It's the triumph of the free-to-play business model, which of course has been happening for a while now in the West, but the regulators are only just beginning to understand what it is. And lastly, it's the perceived need to protect consumers in an online world. Each of those three things has been there for a while, since before the first iPhone, but they're now beginning to combine in ways which are leading to, to regulation, to regulators, to courts getting involved. Of course, it's not as if this was a totally unregulated area before. There's all different kinds of laws that lawyers like me have advised games companies on for a while. But the question is, is that enough? Is data privacy law, consumer protection laws, is that enough on its own to regulate free to play? And the answer from the regulators in the EU is no. We need to have a specific set of laws to govern free to play, whether we like it or not. So the specifics in the EU so far, there's a few things that have been happening. And last year was the inflection point. Last year was when these things began to happen in earnest. Um, last year, the UK's consumer protection regulator, what was called the OFT, decided they were going to carry out an investigation of free-to-play games. Most people in the industry didn't realize it was happening, but they went and talked to a number of games companies, big and small, and released what they call free-to-play principles, eight of them, which they expect all games companies who are operating in the UK to comply with. At the same time, the European Commission felt that they were a little bit worried about what was happening across the whole of the EU. And so they got a number of regulators together. They talked with Apple, Google, Microsoft, a bunch of other folks, and they've come up with principles too. Um, at the same time, back in the UK, we've had a separate regulator totally separately coming up with a series of investigations of mobile games um, with quite worrying uh, consequences, which I'll talk about in a moment. And lastly, that the, the, the wild card of all is Germany, which is really well known for a very stringent protective consumer system, including in games, now wising up to applying those stringent rules to mobile games. To each of these four things, totally uncoordinated, but all arising from the popularity of mobile games. So I'm gonna talk next about my top tips. I don't like to give legal caveats just for the sake of it, but here it is, it is worth it. Don't just take these next 10 tips as the gospel. If you're making a free-to-play game in Europe, it's probably worth having a chat with a lawyer about your game specifically itself. But that said, I'm gonna talk about these next 10 tips now. So, tip number one. If a mobile game isn't totally free, you can't call it free. Um, now, both the UK regulators and the European Commission really disliked the idea of calling a free-to-play game free. This happens quite a lot. It used to happen even at the mobile, even at the platform level, um, and that's changed. So it's fairly easy now for Apple to have made its change, as you will all have seen. It used to say free when you downloaded a free-to-play game. Now it says get. Similarly with Android, it now says install. The reason for that was both in the US and the EU, the platforms came under a lot of pressure and they were being told it's misleading for you to tell consumers a free-to-play game is free. And of course, despite the fact that the industry was trying to explain what we meant by free, they didn't buy it. Now, the real question that's remaining is, can developers use the word free in relation to a free-to-play game without getting into legal trouble? So 
take that example. This is on, this is on the Google Play Store right now. Bejeweled still refers to Bejeweled as free. I suspect it's a matter of time before we get a crackdown from the regulators to the platforms, and the platforms then put pressure on the developers to say, you can't even in your description refer to a game as free if it's free to play. It's unfortunate, um, but that's the direction that we're moving in. Tip number two is to get the app page right. So which of these do you think is the best legally? These are all descriptions from the bottom of an app description. Um, because there's so many of you, I, I won't ask you to raise your hands, but just have a quick think in your head and I'll tell you what I think. It's that one. Not just because it's got the most words and lawyers love words, but because it is actually the one that's the most carefully thought through. It talks about the different kinds of virtual currency there can be in the game, bananas and tokens. It explains that it's optional to use them. It explains that you can choose to wait if you want to, rather than pay money to acquire the currency, if you want to. Um, and it talks about how the purpose of spending real money is to skip ahead. This is all obvious stuff, but the regulators love this kind of stuff because you're not assuming a level of knowledge to consumers. And that's the main problem that regulators have with free-to-play games developers. Either they're not thinking about it, or they just assume the developers understand how the model works. So you will see more of this this year, and you will see more of it next year. I know that traditionally in games you'd have great big long legalese, T's and C's which no one would read and mobile was fairly free of those. It's going to come to mobile for reasons like this. Similarly, all mobile games without exception should now have terms and conditions and a privacy policy. Not just because it's good legal practice, but because that's what the regulators have said, you have to have one. And if you're going to have one, not only have you got to get the right wording and get it right and talk to a lawyer and all the rest of it, but stick it in the app description. It's not very hard. Uh, mobile games which have got a good lawyer on board now, they will have done three things. The first thing they'll do is at the bottom of the app description, they'll have it in the actual text. The second thing they'll do is there's an option on both uh, Android and iOS to refer to it right at the bottom, as I've done on the right-hand image there. That's just an easy way for consumers to, confined it, to find it. The third way, which is still finding some traction, is to put it in the game. The guidance from the regulators is that you have to have the T's and C's in a place that the consumers could find it. And so, again, you will probably see this year some action taken against mobile games on either iOS or Google Play to say, where are your T's and C's? And that's just beginning to happen. It's by no means universal, so watch this space. Next tip, give consumers a direct route to you. It's an easy, it's an easy thing to do. In your in-app your in description, give an email address, a Twitter address, or maybe even a Facebook address, but give users a direct way to reach you. Again, it makes good sense. It's good sense commercially, but it's also a legal requirement under the free-to-play guidelines because the EU said they received a whole bunch of complaints from consumers who didn't know who to talk to. I mean, I've also had clients that have said to me that once they've done this, they notice a fall in one-star reviews of their games because people use the one-star reviews as a way to communicate frustration. So it makes sense commercially and legally as well. Next tip. Consider gating your games. Um, and I only need to point you to Clash of Clans, which is doing this. And if Clash of Clans and Candy Crush are doing things like this, it, then it's something to think about. It also makes sense, again, because the, the, the free-to-play guidelines, they don't explicitly require you to have a gate like this. But finding some way to give a communication like that the first time only is probably a sensible way to ward off problems. Now, there are some companies who are going even further than that. This is what Electronic Arts does with all of its Chilingo games. My understanding is this is now all Chilingo games, of which there were well over a 1,000. When you start the game for the first time, you go through an actual age gate. Now, that's partly for data privacy reasons, but it also serves to have an impact on the free-to-play reasons as well. You, at the moment, there's no legal rule requiring you to do this, but doing this is a relatively easy fix to do the first time someone uses the game. Tip number two is that you should process transactions in a store, not in the game. Regulators really disliked the idea that you could confuse consumers, in their view, by having pop-ups in the middle of the game flow to say, do you want to spend some real money? Regulators in the EU would much rather have a, ga a split so that when they go into a store, they know they're being sold to. When they're in the game, they don't necessarily expect they're being sold to. And so, for example, two, two examples there. So I, I'm, I'm not mentioning any names of these games specifically. You've got the game on the top there, which gives you the opportunity, in order to actually play that game session, 
you may have to spend some real money. Not a good idea. You have the example at the bottom, which says, sorry, you don't have sufficient credits to play whatever this aspect of the game is. Come to the store and you can spend more money. That's something which the regulators prefer more than the first example. Next example, and this is really important, always give users the ability to say no. This is a great example. I've gone through this with a number of developers where if you think about these things in the game design process, it's a relatively easy fix. But loads of games developers just don't think at the time, well, what if someone doesn't want to spend money? Normally what you'll do is either you have a little cross box in the top right hand corner, regulators hated that, always give someone the ability to say no, or at least not yet because then you're explaining the commercial context a bit better. The example at the bottom is particularly egregious because you have a choice of spending a small amount of real money or lots of real money, and, you have, and the consumer has got no real way apart from the cross box of saying, no, I don't want to spend any money at all. And that is going, that's the kind of thing which will be policed a bit more in the future. Um, next uh, tip, and this is the regulator's words, offers should be clear, not aggressive, and not misleading. Now those are obviously quite generic phrases. There's no obvious simple way of ticking a box to say, yes, I'm doing that. It, it's, about, it's about context. And again, it's about the concept of thinking about these things during the design phase. Am I doing something that doesn't have an assumed level of knowledge that a consumer that has never played a free-to-play game before won't be prejudiced by? So I'll give you an example here. And the next three examples all relate to starter packs, which is a particular uh, matter of importance because then you're trying to, of course, monetize the user as soon as possible, and therefore it's the area that could be abused the most easily. So the fact that there's a yes and a no option for this starter pack is good. The fact that it takes place um, in, in a store is also a good idea um, because it splits up commercial intent from gameplay, but it has to be a genuine timer, and I'm going to come back to that in a second. Next example here, an indication this is probably compliant is again, there's a yes and no timer, which is good. But indications that it might not be compliant are that does it take place in the store or in the game? We can't be sure. It probably is in the game rather than in the store. Um, it's not completely clear how much money is actually being spent. You'd have to actually look quite carefully into the top left-hand corner as an average consumer to know that you're spending £2.99 because that's not really what the, what the developer wants you to see. Um, is it truly a one-time offer only? I mean, I would hazard a guess the average consumer might be skeptical that a grenadier, a particular piece of content, will only ever be available if you spend money straight away. That's probably quite unlikely. So if it's not a one-time only offer, that's deceptive. And secondly, um, is the grenadier only available with that particular offer? Again, we don't know, but this, this would worry a regulator. This would worry a regulator even more, unfortunately, for a number of reasons. Yes, there's a yes and no option, which is good. Um, does a transaction take place in store in the game? We don't know. The real money value is hidden behind gems. You can't see what the real world value of this is. Is it truly a rare offer? I don't know. And even after the user says no, you have a cartoony pop-up that says, are you sure that you, want to, that, you, that you want to say no? That's possibly a little bit too aggressive, so we have to be quite careful about things like that. Next thing. Pretty easy, but you'd be surprised at how many games don't do it. Always give users the ability to get paid currency without actually paying for it. It can be through achievements, like in Clash of Clans. It can be through going to Facebook. It can be through any number of things. But regulators have come down informally already on a couple of games where they decided that the only way of using the gems was effectively to pay for it. They said that's just not fair. Lastly, you have to be super careful regarding kids. I know we've had this issue since the comics books, in, since the comics way back in the 20s, we have to protect the kids. But like it or not, a lot of regulators are focusing on free-to-play games as a children's problem. So if you are marketing directly to kids or you think it might be attractive to kids, you have to be careful. Now what does that mean? We don't really know, but the regulators have given some indications. If it's a cartoon type game, if it's on the kids section of the app stores, those are things that, which mean you have to be extra cautious. Now, one example in particular, which is just shows how much of a wild card factor this is, is the GameForge decision. Now, GameForge is a very responsible, very successful German games company. They had a case gone all the way up to the highest court in Germany recently because the German uh, regulators looked at a small section, a really small section of advertising text and said, because it referred to do in, in, the, in the informal term in German, because it used English terms, because it was slang, it must have been directed at kids and therefore they just forced Gameforge to go through this long series of litigation. And the game wasn't even intended to be for kids, like 5% of the player base was for kids, but the regulators didn't care. So 
even if you take some care, unfortunately, there are going to be some mobile games this year which are totally unjustifiably taken to legal action because of a perception that we've got to protect the kids. So what can we see this year? We're probably going to see the first enforcement action in the UK. We will probably see a follow-up wildcard litigation in Germany. One of France, Italy or Spain are going to get involved in this as well. All of this is going to be in a totally un um, uncoordinated way. Um, but the real unknown factor that, that worries me and, and I deal with clients with more and more is, what happens if a regulator starts deciding if free-to-play is fair or not? The only example we've had so far of that is a case involving Dungeon Keeper, which you may or may not be aware of. It, was, um, it had a lot of controversy about it, and a consumer went off to the, one of the UK regulators and said, we're not happy with this. Unlike any other regulator so far, this regulator looked at the actual game mechanics, and they said that they didn't think that the game mechanics was gameplay which would be expected by consumers. Now, goodness knows what's going to happen in 2015 if a regulator starts deciding that they are responsible for what consumers are going to expect in free-to-play. We may not like it, but it's an issue that we're going to have to engage with this year. So I hope that's been a very quick summary of, of 10 tips. And uh, that's me. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Jess. That's great. Um, I think it's also quite interesting. I think the ASA one's interesting, particularly because they're remit is different from some of the other regulators, particularly yeah. because um, they, ha they often have to make um, interpretations on the, f the rightness of a, of a property. So I wonder whether that's an influence. And my hope is that there's so much influence from the, the trade bodies in the various countries to try and lobby in our favor to prevent uh, regulatory bodies trying to get involved in game design that I think hopefully we've got some defense. Is that fair or am I yeah. being optimistic? Yeah, for, for sure. I think one of the best things that you can do, platforms, developers, everyone, is obviously have a look at this online afterwards at SlideShare, um, talk to your trade bodies, talk, talk with your lawyer. Um, and the next time that you're developing a free-to-play game, do take advice from the trade bodies about what can I do sensibly to, to try and ward off some of these issues. Um, but you're right, the trade bodies are helping a great deal. Yeah. So I would normally want to reach out and get questions at this point, but I'm realizing I'm running over a little bit longer than I meant to, so I'm getting a thumbs up from the back to tell me to speed things up. So I'm gonna thank Jazz very much. Should we give him a round of applause? Uh, I'm sure Jazz will be around and I'll be able to answer questions as well. I'll be at the back. Thanks. Thanks very much, guys.